Scottish football, the heartbeat of Scotland, is embedded within communities and can provide that irresistible mix of pleasure. and pain that colours so many lives. Yet, there is a consensus that Scottish football has a bad reputation and is potentially falling behind. Glasgow, home to four professional football teams and three national stadiums, including this one that we're in right now, Cathkin Park. Back in the day, more than 50,000 people have crammed onto these terraces to watch third Lanark play football. It's a sport that holds a proud tradition in Scotland. We were the first people to introduce the pass and move tactic now seen all over the world and the first country to ask women to play back in the Middle Ages. And the current top flight of Scottish football, the Premiership, was introduced well over 100 years ago in 1890 and has been entertaining the masses ever since. Football is a much loved game in Scotland and has become a multi-million pound business, but where does all that money go? A recent report by the SFA and UEFA tells us that more than £700 million has been saved in healthcare thanks to participation in the game and the money brought into the country has totaled over a billion thanks to people playing the sport as well. In this documentary, we will look into the important role that Scottish football plays not just on the pitch, but off it as well. I think Scottish football generally gets a, a bad reputation, but there are 42 professional clubs in Scotland and 41 of them are doing something within their, within their community. So that's, a, that, that's something that we, we need to be talking about. Many small towns in Scotland have football clubs. Some small towns have bigger clubs with community trusts that engage with and improve the community surrounding them. They're the backbone that provide a pathway for future generations to get involved with their local clubs. Throughout the pandemic over the last couple of years, these trusts have received praise and glowing commendations from throughout the Scottish footballing community for the work they've done. Ross County Football Club, formed in 1929, is the most northern team in the top flight. As such, it has a wide catchment area stretching from Invernessshire to Ullapool and the Western Islands. In this catchment area, they use as an advantage for the number of footballers they can include within their programmes. Super busy, our school's programme is pretty much full for this time, which is a huge part of getting the kids to come, our community staff. So for me, my role is managing the schools, so I go contact schools, primary schools, secondary schools, and we go and deliver sessions every, well, one day a week to all the pupils in that school for a term. The last two terms were okay, and now we're at the stage where we're so busy at the minute we can't really take any more for this term. But despite the success, there are always challenges hampering the potential development and impact they can make. A key challenge facing community trusts around Scotland is the lack of access to decent pitches throughout the country. More than 100 council parks have been sold off to land developers in the recent past, just highlighting the scale of the problem. And Scotland's obesity rate is one of the highest in Europe as well, which just means it's even more vital that pitches like these are made available to increase the well-being and the health of kids and adults and relieve pressure on the NHS. Pitches like these need to be unlocked. As Ross County's Community Trust knows all too well. Yeah, that's been the main issue for us, really. Uh, a lot of our staff, especially towards the later stages of the year we've got to do it inside for for uh, the kids obviously we're not wanting them outside when it could be snowing raining so getting indoor facilities have been really tricky to get oh fingers crossed we're in a situation where in the next few months we can we can get some sort of facility where we can get back into those areas that we've not managed to hit from scottish football second home to the third and current one hamden park in mount florida glasgow's south side just a couple of hundred meters from cathkin park across the way there lies Lesser Hamden, where Queen's Park will be playing potentially Championship, maybe League One or League Two football in the coming seasons after they sold the iconic stadium to the SFA in 2020. There are other developmental issues in Scotland that pose problems for trusts to have to adapt to and overcome as well. COVID-19 forced them to quit programmes and vastly reduced the amount of hours that kids were able to spend playing together. Working around restrictions has never been easy, but systems put in place also haven't been the most effective at making sure every kid has an opportunity equal to one another at participating in programmes put on by the trusts. A large part of the Community Trust Network is the SPFL Trust. Established way back now in 1940, they work in juncture with all 42 SPFL clubs, covering 222 local authority areas, which helps them reach almost 85% of the Scottish population. 
Their health officer, James Barber, describes some of the challenges that COVID imposed upon them. The restrictions we faced made it difficult to run programmes. Some programmes we ran um, work in a face-to-face -face delivery, so how do we change that to, to online without losing the quality of the programme? The challenge we had was how do we fund it? Some of our funding or some of our money was, was maybe halted for various reasons, some of it was, was gone for various reasons, so how do you, how do we then go and fund it? Um, a lot of our funding comes through grants and, and through kind of restricted money, so though sometimes it can be documented that we get a lot of donations or we get X, Y and Z as income, a lot of it's restricted income, so it's not, if we can't use it for a particular thing, then we can't use it at all. So for example, our football fans and training programme is funded on the basis it's a face-to-face -face delivery. So when COVID hit, we had to rethink it. How do we, we can't use the money to do it online. We don't know if it'll work online. So how do we overcome that? Um, another challenge we had was the access to, to our clubs being able to access facilities. Um, going back to talking about the hook, we like a lot of our programme has delivered as close to the club as possible, if they can do it in the stadium, brilliant. But we found during COVID that Stadiums are obviously closed, stadiums are, are not got the capacity to have, they've maybe not got the rooms big enough to have two metre distancing, they've maybe not um, got the facilities to offer an outdoor area or a well ventilated area. With a red zone that was in place for a long time and still is in place in the Championship. Away teams are now getting changed in, in boardrooms, in hospitality lounges, in halls. So that's then space that the community trust or the charities can't use for the programme. So. Great uses of football are happening off the pitch too, with programmes put on by trusts similar to ones used in other industries. The hook of football though is very important to make these programmes more enticing for people to come along, as Celtic Foundation CEO Tony Hamilton explains. If you just take Celtic FC Foundation as, as one example, a lot of the people that we encounter here in, in our project delivery either um, some of them are Celtic supporters, some of them support other football clubs, maybe another football club in Glasgow. Um, some of them are football agnostics effectively, that they, that, that they just don't care. But the hook here um, is coming through the doors of a football club, you know, Celtic Park as a, as a, a case in point. And that's, um, that's the big attraction for people. They come in here, they're made to feel welcome, it's a safe environment for them um, and that's hugely important and that's happening across the board. So our principal aims are twofold, um, to try and alleviate poverty within our communities and we do that in various ways and to include people who would otherwise be excluded. So for example, one that covers both of those things would be um, young offenders who have been released from prison. Um, our job is to to break the poverty cycle um, would be to try and keep them out of prison and help them into employment, for example. And then there are other parts of the population that we try and include. So children and young people who live with autism or Down syndrome or complex physical disabilities. So, for example, we built a sensory room here at Celtic Park, which overlooks the pitch from the East Stand the Lisbon Lion Stand and um, we run that um, for children and young people who have sensory impairment who otherwise wouldn't be able to come here. There's always the question about where money has gone. However, there is a revenue stream coming into football in Scotland that needs a rethink. The current TV deal stands at £25 million per season, split between all 42 SPFL clubs, with the winners of the Premiership getting £3.35 million. With the new Sky deal, the value of Scottish football matches has dropped by over £116,000 per match, which in total sees Scotland miss out on over £7 million. Sky also failed to fill their quota last campaign of 48 games live on TV and from this, the SPFL owe the company £5 million in games they didn't show, which has been renegotiated to be spread over the next five campaigns, meaning the prize fund for clubs has been reduced. The SPFL work in the best interest of the Scottish Domestic League, but some fans can't shake the feeling that the league is currently undersold to TV broadcasters. The current deal includes all four Old Firm games per season, the last of which pulled in almost 750,000 viewers, plus most of the Glasgow side's away games throughout the campaign. But there are more enticing games featuring sides from throughout the division that are left off our screens. 
Um, it came at a time when BT was actually putting the brakes on um, their investments, so there wasn't much competition to Sky. Um, but I think debate around how you know how viable that is. I think the current study, Aberdeen and the other clubs involved in the Deloitte study, I think um, to reevaluate how much Scottish football is worth is very healthy. Researching TV deals of countries with similar populations showed that the likes of Norway and Denmark earn per season 60 million and 45 million respectively, raising eyebrows as to why Scotland can't get that sort of money with the country the most supported league in Europe. As per head of population, more Scots attend football matches than any other European nation. So what are the key elements that the SPFL has to take into account when the bidding war begins for our product? Possibly accuse the league of maybe not negotiating as, as good a deal as possible, but they have had various difficult things to work with. Market dynamics of the UK, um, you know, BT and Sky have often um, worked together in many respects and there's been a lack of competition uh, for the rights. And I think you've got to also remember that obviously Scotland is, is part of a UK media market and has suffered from the fact that the UK media market has a sort of golden egg, which is the English Premier League. When somebody's come in and said, look, we're going to pay over the odds for this um, to really establish ourselves, that, that's never really happened in, in the recent history of Scottish football, whereas other leagues around Europe um, have benefited from somebody coming in and, and really overpaying because of competition. A lack of competition has meant that hasn't happened. The SPFL have made recent strides in obtaining sponsorships for the league, one with Cinch Car Dealership, one with Glens Vodka, and also securing the naming rights for the League Cup. And these sort of partnerships are welcomed by supporters in the hope that their clubs will prosper financially and that the money will trickle down into the youth systems to help development. There are some exciting new ventures in Scottish football at the moment, not least with the women's game, as the SWFL is incorporated into the SPFL. And this is a fantastic opportunity for the women's game to be given more prominence and grow within Scottish football. The next challenge for them is to get their hands on more money. And this comes from an increased prize pot or potentially bigger TV deals with the SPFL. And Shelley Kerr believes that this is a promising start, but that more needs to be done. The women's game is evolving and it has done over the last, um, in particular the last 10 years in Scotland. Um, and sports should be inclusive for everyone and that's football as well. So I think it's, it's hugely important that the pathway caters for everyone. Um, so from a Scottish FA perspective, um, you have to ensure that there's integration and that everyone that wants to play football gets an opportunity regardless of gender, whatever level you're at, you know, what your background, where you come from. So all these things are so important. I think in a nutshell, it's about changing perception. Um, still, people have got a perception about women's football, but the more, um, the more it's visible, the more professional it gets, the more resource um, that's generated that comes into the women's game, then the better that's going to be and the better chance you have of changing people's perception. With the financial gains made in the sport, there are a few key areas identified to help ensure the future of Scottish football remains looking bright. One of those are the community trusts, centred in an area and providing life-changing opportunities for kids to stay mentally and physically stimulated as they develop. You kind of love to hate football sometimes, but the whole more than 90 minutes is absolutely true because Football changes lives. Maybe not necessarily the ninety minutes, but what comes after the ninety minutes changes lives. And and what you spoke about there, the hook, the football club gets these young people in, gets these old people in, gets whoever through the door. And once they're through the door and we've got them, we can maybe give them the help they need or the the guidance they need. When looking at the impacts of community trusts across Scotland, it's easy to see how valuable they are. Not just in terms of developing the beautiful game, but the country as a whole and working with those trusts and the SFA is vital to make sure the trusts stay well funded and linked within football. Now across the next few years there's many exciting things happening at domestic level and nationally for Scotland and we just can't wait to see how it all plays out because well, football is just brilliant.